Hi, welcome to Curator's Corner with the International Spy Museum. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education here at the Spy Museum. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to listen to some really amazing people. Uh, Vince Houghton, our historian and curator, is going to be leading this discussion today, and he'll be introducing um, his fellow panelists, uh, former intelligence analysts who are going to be looking at information about the pandemic and how how their unique perspective tells them more or less about what we're all hearing on the news or reading in the media. Um, I hope that um, you will forgive any ambient noises you hear, rainstorms, children rising from their beds, Vince's cat, who's very interested in everything Vince does. And I love Elwood, so we, we've got to keep him happy. Thanks for bearing with us in any technical difficulties. I'm going to turn this over to my dear friend, Vince Houghton, and I will disappear for a little bit. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, this is obviously an odd way of doing things. Amanda and I usually sit about 10 feet apart. Uh, we're, we're now an inch away from each other on a screen, but we actually haven't seen each other in person. Like so many of you, uh, haven't seen your coworkers in quite some time. So this is always fun. I, I, this is great for me. I get to hang out at least virtually with two of my close friends, uh, two extraordinary people who I've known for years now. Uh, one is my predecessor at the museum, Mark Stout. Uh, who is historian number three at the International Spy Museum. Uh, before, he did more than that. Before that, he spent 13 years as an intelligence analyst, both for the State Department INR, which is their analysis wing, as well as for the CIA. Um, I'm only going to give a truncated uh, bio because we've got a lot of stuff we want to talk about. Uh, both of their bios are available, certainly on our website. Uh, you can only say so much about someone, both of these people have extraordinary lives, and it would be here half the time talking about what they've done in their lives. So let me talk about Cindy Storr, uh, <laughs> who somehow spent 20 years at CIA. Uh, you must have started when you were about 15 years old. Uh, what's extraordinary about Cindy is, you know, most of you have heard the name Osama bin Laden. Uh, she knew it before all of us did. She was hunting the guy long before we ever knew who the hell he was. Uh, and you can hear a little bit of her story uh, in a fascinating documentary called Manhunt, which is based on the book by Peter Bergen. So definitely check that out. But both Cindy and Mark are both uh, world-tested analysts who are the perfect people to bring today to talk about what intelligence analysts are looking at when you have an event like we're living through today. Because like it or not, this is a world-changing event. This is a, where were you on 9-11? Where were you during the Cuban Missile Crisis or Pearl Harbor? the Kennedy assassination. These are moments that are generationally transformative. Uh, and so for intelligence analysts, in many respects, I don't wanna call them giddy, but this is kind of a moment for them to shine where they kind of get to put their work and their training into action. So let me start actually thinking about, and this is gonna be hard for us to do, think about a time before the pandemic. I know it feels like it was years and years ago, but it was only a couple weeks where we were, what we say in the intelligence community, left of boom, where, it was prior to when all this craziness broke out. On a normal day, in a normal intelligence agency, at the CIA two years ago, are people there, or within the IC as a whole within the United States, are people paying attention to stuff like diseases and epidemics and the spread of new and interesting uh, symptoms that are popping up around the world? Is this something that the intelligence community pays attention to? Let's start with Mark. Yeah, no, it very, very much isn't. By the way, thanks, Vince. It's it's great to be here, and I always enjoy uh, hanging out with Cindy as well. Um, yeah, um, in, infectious diseases, um, epidemics have been something that the intelligence community has looked at for a for a very long time. And in fact, there is an intelligence agency. I guess technically, it's a subsidiary of, of DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the uh, National Center for Military Intelligence, which is up at Fort Detrick, uh, which has this sort of thing as one of its core functions. Uh, but even at the more general purpose intelligence agencies like Maine DIA or CIA, uh, these kinds of um, things are sort of always, always on the, always on the agenda for in places like CIA's Office of Global Issues, um, 
And I was uh, I was looking the other day at uh, some of the declassified records in CIA's online Freedom of Information Act reading room, and I was reminded, you know, back in the 80s and 90s when HIV AIDS was a particularly salient issue. I mean, there were huge numbers of analyses and reports published on sort of the the extent of that uh, of that pandemic and what's likely to be its implications for stability in various places in sub-Saharan Africa, and how is it going to affect military readiness of this, that, or or the other country. Um, and as far back as you know, the Cold War itself, um, all sorts of clandestine reporting and 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 analyses, um, you know, maybe not a lot of those sort of sort of super high level uh, salient stuff, but but looking at what are the people in the in the communist bloc, you know, what do they know about epidemics and and infectious diseases? What research are they doing? Where have they had outbreaks um, and those sorts of things? So this is um, fortunately something that doesn't usually arise to public attention. Um, but is a is a is a constant line of work in the intelligence community. So, Cindy, Mark's talked a little bit about the IC looking at pandemics and looking at epidemics. Are there places within the broader government or within the UN or other things? Like, does the World Health Organization have intelligence analysts? Does the CDC have intelligence analysts? Are there people within the epidemic and pandemic community that are doing what you guys are doing at CIA? Yeah, I mean, definitely the World Health Organization does. I, I mean, CDC does. I still don't know about WHO. Is anybody ever able to figure that out? But they certainly, if, even if they don't, I assume that they do, but even if they don't, they would benefit from the same kinds of information. Um, and the reason is, as Mark was alluding to, a lot of countries don't really share their their data. Um, and so, and it's not just the communist countries who don't share. <laughs> and so, if we're going to stay on top of this and do what's called biosurveillance, right? So we're constantly surveilling um, the situation with regard to infectious diseases and stuff like that so that we can be prepared to provide strategic warning if necessary or tactical warning. Um, then people have to be able to collect that information on the ground or through SIGINT or some other way, right? So that's a standard part of, of uh, Kind of what goes on all the time in addition to which people have and this is in government and outside of government have worked for decades to develop sets of indicators for specific kinds of of uh, infectious diseases and pandemics things that you would never think of for instance years ago i was introduced to an indicator of when you're looking at china and i don't know if this is still true but it was a while back um, if you start to see a lot of people show up in the hospitals with breathing problems, it could be because they are, but not pneumonia, right? They're just having breathing issues and the hospitals are filling up. It could be because people are boiling vinegar to clear their houses from a disease and the boiling of the vinegar too much causes respiratory distress. So that level of indicator has been developed by many organizations and they share that information. At the strategic level, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna just throw on briefly, at the, at the strategic level, um, as well, um, as you may know, the, the National Intelligence Council uh, does, I think every five years, does something called uh, Global Trends. It's basically a national intelligence estimate. It's prepared, unclassified, and actually publicly released about, you know, you know, big tectonic shifts that they see uh, in, 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 in uh, you know, world affairs. And back in, I think, about 2000, it was, they had a section in there on what might halt or reverse globalization. And there were a couple of number of things on that list. One of them was a, a you know a, a, a global rise of nationalism, but another one was a major global pandemic. Yeah. Um, and I think you actually, arguably, you see both of those things going on and interacting uh, right now as well. Um, and I mean, I don't think we're going to see the end of globalization as a result of this, but certainly, you know, the 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 march of globalization has uh, you know um, had its style cramped a little bit uh, uh, by the closing of borders and the economic downturn and the reduction of trade um, and you know and also the pandemic is is contributing to um, sort of um, nationalist leaders reasserting their power. So yeah, so there's a, a lot of lot of lot of stuff that goes that goes on in the intelligence community and 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 has um, more or less forever around these sets of That's great. You mentioned that, Mark. I want to read a statement from the uh, 2019 uh, Worldwide Threat Assessment, which is given to Congress every year and and unclassified version published except for the past year. Um, we can all speculate about why that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> It says, we assess the United States and the world will remain vulnerable to the next flu pandemic or large scale outbreak 
of a contagious disease that could lead to massive death rates of death and disability, severely affect the world economy, strain international resources, and increase calls on the United States for support. And that was January 2019. Well, that's a wonderful segue. We couldn't even plan this if we had tried to. My next question, we kind of talked about indicators and warnings and the idea that the job of an element, a huge part of the job of intelligence is to warn policymakers about something that's coming. And in this case, again, without getting, we've already, you know, we're, we're nipping the political side of things. Without getting, you can say whatever you want. I can't get political, but without getting too political, I'm not there, getting were, there were warnings. I, there, there were, we know now there were multiple warnings about this. And I, I don't want to fall into the trap of kind of the 9-11 thing where it's very easy to Monday morning quarterback this. Right. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what could have been done based on our past because as a historian, I hate when people are saying, well, if you just looked at the flu of 1918, we would have known what to do. A hundred years ago gives us no real information about what to do today. And so how do you actually look at policymakers and say, you got to shut down, you got to make sure everyone locks themselves in their houses, right? I mean, that's to me, that's as ridiculous to expect Donald Trump to do back in February than it would be for George Bush on 9-10 2001 to ground all airplanes in the United States. I, I might be wrong, but Cindy, you certainly have, sort of yeah. have an opinion about this. <laughs> so a um, couple thoughts about that. One is um, the difference between strategic and tactical warning, which we've, you know, everybody's talked about before. And even if you know strategically that something could be coming, trying to decide when you're in that moment tactically, as you were alluding to Vince, can be difficult especially if you're getting mixed messages from different organizations, how bad is the pandemic, is it getting out of China, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the second thing is that the idea behind strategic warning and all intelligence organizations do, and which the US government did do in various ways to some extent over the last couple of decades, is to prepare a plan of action for if and when that happens. So theoretically, you would have looked back at the, the pandemic of 1918, and uh, 1919, and you would have said, social distancing works, right? And that could be compared to social distancing and uh, related to other pandemics as well. So, but then once those plans are put in, so let's say people in the government listen and they've had decades and decades to do this and they put plans in place, then administrations change and people have different priorities and then you have to talk to new policymakers who've never thought about it before and then you're in a crisis. And so there's just so many moving parts. It can be really tough. Yeah, and, and, and also, I mean, warning, sort of in intelligence theology, if you will, warning is said to have happened when the policymaker hears and understands the message, okay? Doesn't mean they have to do anything about it. Doesn't mean they have to believe you or think you're right. Just as long as they've actually heard you, like we've communicated, warning has happened. Um, and I mean, I probably we all have our own opinions about how the US government has handled um, this particular crisis, but what I would say generically is that policymakers, and you sort of alluded to this, Vince, policymakers always have um, a gazillion policy and political uh, and, and ideological goals that they're trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, intelligence analysts like me and Cindy used to be, like, we bring bad news. And we're the ones who walk in and say, we think your plans are going to, you know, you know what. Um, and, um, and, and, and so, Policymakers are, are understandably somewhat resistant to that. And from, from the analyst's point of view, that can look like, I don't know, intellectual dishonesty or stupidity, and sometimes it is. Um, but on the other hand, we pay these policymakers, we pay presidents and generals and secretaries of state and all this to get hard things done, to actually find a way that the country can have its cake and eat it too. Uh, so there's a difficult dynamic with, with any kind of warning situation. Within that context, you know, Leaders can do better or leaders can do worse, but it's a fundamentally fraught situation. So historians can debate all they want to about whether or not this was handled correctly, but let's leave that behind and let's just go to where we are right now. Because you know we can cry over spilled milk all we want, but let's think about what's going on this moment and, and kind of in that CIA, at DIA, about uh, places around the world. What are intelligence analysts being tasked to do today? when it comes to this pandemic? What are some of the big questions coming down from policymakers that intelligence analysts such as yourself would be facing moving forward? 
Cindy, you want to have first snack at this? Oh, sure. So, you know, they're going to be looking for uh, a lot of things that they always look for, just exacerbated by the pandemic. So does this affect um, political stability? Is it going to cause economic problems? Um, how bad is the pandemic? Because I said people hide information or they just don't know. So what's happening in China is that not only are we getting reports that, which is typical for China, by the way, that people are afraid to report the right numbers because they might get in trouble and lose their jobs, especially early on in the pandemic. Um, but also that the government itself, partly because of that and partly just because it's so big, they don't necessarily have all the right numbers. Um, and so sometimes it's, you know, we have to figure out what they think they know and also what we think we know that isn't what they know, <laughs> if that makes any sense, right? And that has to do with all the categories that I, that I mentioned. Um, and, you know, military forces is another thing that you'll be looking at. What is military readiness like in these various countries? And, and uh, I think I'll pass that one over to Mark. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, but I wanted to jump on, on something you just said, Cindy, about um, trying to understand what's going on with the course of the disease in places like, you know, particularly China and Iran, which has been, you know, particularly yeah. not forthcoming, but other countries as well. Um, but in countries like China and Iran, um, um, the, the lower level folks don't always, as you alluded to, don't always tell the truth. I mean, even to the extent that they know what the truth is, what really is going on on the ground, they don't always um, report it then up the chain is what I was trying to say. And we saw this in a different context in Iraq with Saddam Hussein's government, right? Um, where, um, uh, you know, we, we got in after into Baghdad afterwards and started looking at their government records. And we found out that even in some cases where we had, you know, really excellent intelligence access into sort of high level decision making, um, if those guys, are, those top leaders are being fed lies, and they were, um, you know, our exquisite access doesn't actually tell us a whole lot. Um, and I, I, I can hypothesize that that could easily be the case in China, right? That if we, if we, I don't know, if we could read Xi Jinping's, uh, you know, uh, morning email inbox, we still might not know what's going on in China because he may not be being told the truth. Right. Um, and that's why we turn to, you know, intercepts of various kinds. Um, you know, cyber intercepts and, and, you know, phone calls and just people, people on the ground, social media to try to get a view that the government itself might not have. Yeah, get a broad-based view um, yeah. and hopefully you can approximate that. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, sorry, go, go ahead, Mark. I was, oh, gonna I was say, just going to say, go ahead. <laughs> just briefly on, 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 on military. conversations go this way. We just kind of, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> hold off on the military thing. Hold off on the military thing for a second. Okay. I want to get that's fine. one thing. So let me let me ask one of the the big reason obviously oh, I'm having my stuff flying all one of the big reasons that we want accurate information um, other than to give our policymakers uh, a heads up or, or at least knowledge about what's going on is also because surprisingly or maybe not surprisingly to two of you but I'm surprised about how much of a propaganda war is going on right now mm -hmm. of how much not just made in Russia being sent to Italy into the United States but the idea of you know, even the U.S. government in some cases calling it the Chinese virus and the Chinese coming back and saying it was here. I, I think back to the HIV AIDS, um, you know, black ops, black propaganda operation, uh, you know, saying that we, we created it. There are certainly conspiracy theories out there, you know, not just in the wackadoodle level where it's actually funneling into the more mainstream to where this was some kind of a bioweapon that got loose. Um, that's obviously not the case, but enough people start thinking about it. You know, you start to get that moving uh, and then you actually accomplish something. And then, so how much does getting accurate information matter to combating some of these propaganda, I mean, or, or fueling our own propaganda in many respects if we find information that helps us and hurts someone else? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, the, the, these sorts of events are, are ripe for uh, propaganda and for uh, influence and disinformation campaigns. And you, you alluded to, to one of them in the Cold War when the, uh, when the KGB um, very successfully uh, put around the, the idea that HIV AIDS was a biological weapon that had escaped from Fort Detrick, Maryland uh, and made its way into the community. They'd done something similar back in the 70s, I think it was. They had spread um, propaganda that the US government uh, was um, uh, was developing some sort of biological weapon that would kill only black people. That propaganda aimed, obviously, mostly um, mostly at, uh, at 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 Africa. Um, so yeah, um, so 
um, I, I imagine that the the folks who study you know the the, the Russian and the Chinese and whatnot intelligence services and like counterintelligence staffs are probably very very interested in what they're doing uh, on that side um, and and collecting um, hard against that. Um, on top of that, though, you're you're right uh, that the um, uh, sort of development of public opinion um, around the world and what that um, does to build up or to erode soft power, both of us and of, of, of other uh, uh, countries out there, I'm certain is something that's being done sort of more in kind of a, maybe in the media analysis kind of end of things. I would hypothesize that that would be something that the, the open source enterprise uh, might be might be putting a whole lot of work into uh, sort of re global reactions to and propagation of some of those uh, conspiracy theories. Let me just briefly, and then I'll shut up and let Cindy talk. Um, there, I agree with you, this is, this present pandemic is not something that escaped from a from a weapons lab. This is not an escaped biological weapon. Um, but such ideas are not necessarily a priori actually crazy. In 1979, I believe it was, might have been 78, I think it was 79, um, the Soviets had a little bit of an accident at a biological weapons facility in Sverdlovsk, uh, now known as Yekaterinburg, and let out a bunch of anthrax and a whole bunch of people died. And there was a um, disinformation campaign that they mounted to conceal that and to blame this on a, a natural outbreak of anthrax that continued well, into the 1990s, I guess, when Boris Yeltsin, who'd actually been a uh, party boss in that part of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, sort of fessed up that, yeah, this really was. Well, um, Ken so, published his book too, which is and Ken Alibek, yep. somewhere. Uh, <laughs> about that. A good book, I recommend it. Anyway, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cindy, I have anything to jump in on that? Um, just a, a, a twist on that. So there are criminal elements out there in the world and various non-state actors who are taking advantage of the situation too. Um, and those are two different things, right? So we have, um, you have your typical terrorist groups and insurgent groups and, you know, civil war, people fighting civil wars who are also issuing propaganda related to this. But most of that ha most of that just says oh it's your it's punishment from god or punishment from whoever for you bad people doing whatever it is that you you did right um so that's something the intelligence community is watching but they're also watching to see what kind of if these groups try to take a group, any kind of advantage of the situation and what we typically see and there's a lot of that happening now but there's also some other things um often these kinds of groups will use the situation to gain followers if the government isn't doing a good job of dealing with the pandemic. So they'll say, oh, the government's failing you. This is terrible. We're going to take over here. We're going to give you masks and money and give you advice to stay home and just do all that stuff. And there are several groups doing that right now. Um, yeah. I, I, saw, I saw a news article the other day, and I, I, I don't know much about this, um, but uh, reporting that um, uh, law enforcement authorities in uh, parts of Italy were very concerned that the mafia might, in a similar sort of dynamic, be in a position to exploit this. Not so much right now, uh, necessarily, but when we start to come, or when Italy starts to come out of this, um, in terms of providing, you know, offering loans uh, at, at seemingly, uh, you know, sort of a, on a seemingly attractive terms to small businessmen who are, or, or business people, pardon me, who are struggling, who, you know, the alternative might be their business going out, you know, going away. But, you know, once the mafia loans you money, you know, they've got you. Uh, and, and, and the story was saying that the Italian authorities are very concerned uh, 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 about that. Um, you familiar, coming back in style. Um, <laughs> my name, so is, really my name is not part. Vincent by accident. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I think, and this is something that I think we can talk about all of us, because you know we all have kind of our own perspective on this. Is I think one thing that kind of shocked a lot of people about this, and maybe woken up a lot of people about how severe this pandemic is, is it's not just some old person in a nursing home get it. It's the prime minister of the United Kingdom tested positive for coronavirus, right? You have almost the entire Iranian leadership is tested, you know, positive in one way or another. People who have been very close to President Trump and Vice President Pence have tested positive. Have sometimes the cases died of coronavirus. We're in, a, in Brazil, like the entire leadership. So these are major countries, major huge economies. I mean, Brazil's a massive economy, obviously the UK. How much can we look to history as a guide for political instability caused by these? And how much are we worrying about that? I mean, UK has the rel relatively 
well, nothing's written down in the UK as far as the constitution concerned, but they have an understanding about, you know, they only know. right, a continuation <laughs> of power, obviously here in the United States, we know what's gonna happen. But in some of these countries, are we looking for indicators of potential power plays that might take place to overthrow a government if all of a sudden the president and the vice president get sick? Are people going to take advantage of that? Cindy, the speaking I think you looked at this a bit. <laughs> the speaking on the um, uh, about countries that are unstable to begin with, or dictatorships that are we always say they're stable until they're not. You know, they they go poof one day. And the causes, the factors have always been under there, but they just look stable on the surface. Um, countries like that, what, typical, what has happened in many parts of the world, and it depends on what people believe in that part of the world and their, their faith system and all of that. But you will often see um, during the crisis, uh, people will may blame it on the government. Um, this is this is uh, this is an act of God against the current government, and you and the government didn't handle it well. So you get both of those things. And then sometimes revolutions do follow. Um, we saw a lot of this in Central America with earthquakes and volcanoes and things like that. Um, so that's one thing that people will be looking for is, is that longer term effect. During the crisis itself, generally, and then there are exceptions, but generally people hunker down and they're just trying to handle the crisis. It's, uh, it's the same phenomenon we see during World, World War I and World War II, major conflicts where People are busy dealing with that, but they're laying the seeds for something later. Right, Mark. Yeah, I mean, you could also. I'm going. Let me let me let me, let me lead your question. The way sure. you're going to ignoring the specificity of a pandemic, are there people paying attention to how countries respond to this oh, to yeah. understand how they respond to big crises? I mean, oh, I, yeah. I, in my notes, I had like dress rehearsal for a bio attack. Let's not even get that specific. Let's talk about just major screw ups and how the country responds, major crises, economic downturns, all these things. And this has to be a, just a windfall of intelligence, understanding how each country is dealing with this in their own special way. Yeah, I mean, a couple of thoughts. One, at the very general level, I think it, um, you, you do learn a lot about a country uh, when you see how well and how functionally uh, it responds to a crisis, both the government and then sort of the broader uh, polity. But um, more specifically, yeah, absolutely. And there was an article in, Oh, heck, I don't recall just offhand. It might have been the New York Times, don't quote me on this, um, but but a little while back, um, claiming, uh, and I don't have any direct knowledge of this, if I did, I, I couldn't discuss it, but claiming that the CIA <laughs> was using this as an opportunity to understand the, um, basically, the, the continuity of government, uh, um, you know, plans and, and capabilities and, uh, uh, and strategies of China, right? Um, the kinds of things that might become important if, God forbid, you know, we go to China. Um, and sort of on the flip side of that, there was an article maybe a week ago, again, I think it was in the Times, um, talking about um, how when, when, when concern about the pandemic started to build up in uh, the National Security Council staff, some of the efforts here in the United States, at the White House, some of the efforts they took um, to make sure that, you know, if, if, the, if the pandemic hit the National Security Council staff, that it wouldn't kill all of them, right? So they, they sort of physically divorced themselves, like the deputy took part of his staff and went off to one building and it, they don't go to the other building and vice versa. And some other, some things were moved to like, you know, bunkers uh, and that sort of thing that, I, that I'm sure, again, would be a windfall for people like the Russians and the Chinese against the day, God forbid, that there's some sort of serious confrontation or even even war between us. Um, yeah, so there's there's lots to be learned here. And of course, these changes in behaviors then probably um, cut off certain avenues or impede certain av avenues of intelligence collection, but they probably enable other avenues of intelligence collection. So just think about what we're doing right now, right? I mean, obviously this is public, but but um, uh, by intent. Um, but if uh, you know, if some foreign intelligence agency had wanted to know uh, what was going on at a spy museum you know, event. Uh, previously, they would have had to either sent an agent to the event or put a bug in the, you know, in the in the event space. Um, now we're holding it virtually across the internet. And so maybe they maybe they didn't have an agent who could put a bug in the in in in, in your building at L'Enfant Plaza, but maybe they've got you know cyber access into this particular platform that we're using now. And voila, they've got everything, right? So imagine that sort of in the world of of secrets or of maybe not classified, but of sensitive information like commercial information, for instance. Which of course we do have a current example of. Um, 
so zoom has had a zoom that people use has had a lot of problems and uh which you know which happens people you know when just people start using stuff and you find all kinds of issues um but it turns out that uh, a lot of their base, their coders and and the routing goes through china they're new <laughs> so that's become a concern of the u.s government <laughs> well i mean i think this is the thing you kind of threw this out here almost mark nonchalantly i think this is a massive topic of conversation where human intelligence collection is almost impossible at this point. I mean, right. you're not going to big galas at embassies. You're not in a position where you can meet someone on a street corner and it looks, I mean, it looks suspicious before. It's even more <laughs> suspicious now. If you're having kind of clandestine meetings in the middle of the night. Um, it, humans is much more difficult, but SIGINT, this is the kind of the heyday. I mean, the NSA is, has to be very busy right now. You know, you need 8200, all these ones around the world because everybody is online. Everyone is having these kinds of meetings. Everyone from us doing this to the highest levels of the government. And even, you know, for a lot of the real juicy intel doesn't come from a National Security Council meeting. It comes from the middle management of the Department mm -hmm. of the Treasury, right? It comes from that Zoom or that, that, that go-to meeting from some of the people giving economic indicators from the Midwest and the Department of Agriculture. Now, those don't sound all that sexy. It's right, we're not talking about the F-35, but for the Chinese and for others, this is really important information that would be considered secret, but now all of a sudden it's very hackable and very easy to get to. But, Cindy, you said something interesting to me when we were talking a couple of days ago about there's a part of intelligence that actually had gotten much easier to do, and that's open source. Because we're now in a position where we are so much more connected, perhaps, than we were before, that makes open source intelligence maybe even that much better than what we were doing before. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, open source intelligence, especially since, uh, you know, in the last couple of decades, since the explosion of, you know, Facebook and just the whole internet, the interwebs, as Mark said earlier, um, <laughs> it it's definitely making it makes for a whole new spin on open source intelligence on Austin. And you can often find just as good information up to 80 or 90 percent, right, in open sources. That's been the latest estimates that I've read anyway. I, I don't know, I'm not in there anymore, right? But this is just what I'm seeing from some people, um, researchers on the outside. You can get to a certain percentage with open source information. So that means, it means a couple of things. One, everybody can be better informed. But secondly, you are now able to better target your classified collection systems because you're not collecting on stuff that you can just get from all of a sudden everybody's available on chattering. And so it's a win-win. Or you mentioned military readiness before, and I wanna really hunker down on that. There was a report today that 10% of the crew of the USS Teddy Roosevelt, which is a massive U.S. aircraft carrier, really the- I think I've heard of it, yeah. The nickname is the big stick, right? I mean, this is this is the key to American projection of power, right, our aircraft carriers. One in every 10 crew members has tested positive, which means that, you know, if you extrapolate from that, that much more of the crew has it than we even know about at this point. That aircraft carrier is not ready to fight a war, right? That basically, that needs to be put in a point. I don't care what they say. The Navy can blow smoke all they want saying we're really combat ready. It's not, right? When 10% of your crew it has coronavirus, you're not ready to fight a war. That's a problem for us, obviously. What are we looking at for other countries when it comes to military readiness? What are the analysts doing to understand those kind of issues uh, where information may not be forthcoming? Certainly, if you're not getting it, from the general population. It's even more difficult mm -hmm. to get it from the military. How do you kind of gauge if World War III started tomorrow, God forbid, how do you gauge how ready everyone's gonna be? Yeah, so a couple of thoughts. So um, first off, yeah, the, the Teddy Roosevelt obviously has been a lot in the news in the United States recently, but my understanding is that there are um, maybe less politically explosive, but analogous situations. I, I, I've heard there's a, a two Russian submarines um, submarines would be about the only thing right. worse than a surface ship to be cooped yeah. up in when you've got pandemic. One Dutch submarine, a similar sort of situation I read about. So um, I would argue actually that navies, particularly of the various kind of kinds of armed services, are probably um, the most likely to to have these sort of really intense um, local outbreaks. 
um, because their you know their units are literally um, self-contained. Um, but in terms of readiness, yeah, I mean, so if I was a, once again a military analyst at CIA, um, I would be looking at first off whatever tidbits I can get, whether it's through open source or SIGINT or or whatever that speaks directly to the question of you know are there army units, are there air force units, or whatever that are having particular problems. But also I'd be looking at indirect indicators. Um, so uh, do the uh, you know do the units have morning formation? Um, are they actually out on the you know in the exercise uh, uh, areas or on the shooting ranges actually training or not? Um, uh, have there been changes there? Um, and also I'd be looking at um, sort of uh, you know leadership kinds of questions, sort of marrying uh, what we were talking about earlier with regard to you know national political leaders to to military leaders. Are there generals or admirals or you know, uh, wing commanders or whatever that have suddenly, you know, vanished uh, for no good reason that I might hypothesize um, are sick. Um, and then sort of bring those all together into a sort of an overall qualitative uh, qualitative uh, 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 estimate. And this, of course, is another reason why people might not share information. So right. it would, yeah, it could literally, literally be a military secret. Not sharing information, right? Um, and as Mark knows well, you guys, both of you guys know well, this is what happened in World War One as well. Nobody wanted to talk about just how much their troops were affected by this. And so that's why it's called the Spanish flu, even though it didn't originate in Spain, because the Spanish talked about it and the, the other folks didn't, so. <laughs> yeah, Spain, Spain, Spain was not in the war, so they didn't have military censorship. Right. So they were reporting, their, their press was reporting more or less freely on this, and so they got stuck with the name. Yep. But it was it could equally have well, well been the American flu or the German flu or the French flu or or exactly. whatever. So I think it should be the Belgian flu. I don't ever trust the Belgian. <laughs> <laughs> well, Loon's always I Belgian. Should be the Belgian. Belgian. Um, I spent some good times in Brussels. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about terrorism because terrorism you 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 spent a lot of time in your career hunting down terrorists. Um, so I, if you were at CIA today, what would be your biggest worry? Would it be that Kind of the main purpose of al-Qaeda and ISIS in the past has been to bring down Arab governments that were Western friendly. Would it be, you know, this is a, taking an opportunity as an advantage to use this as a weapon? I mean, again, I think of uh, a, a terrorist that is very sick with coronavirus going inside somewhere and trying to spread it before there's social distancing. Or, on the other hand, is it safer now because there's no targets? There's no large groups of people. There are no movie theaters to bomb. There are no cafes to shoot up. There are no places that you can go and look at for a mass casualty event. What kind of, what, what is the, the CIA counterterrorism center, the National Counterterrorism Center doing today when it comes to the coronavirus? That's a really good question. Um, certainly they'd be looking at all of the various groups out there and how they're, how they're responding to the virus. So what they say in public, which is, you know, this is all the West Ball, God hates you. And then what they say in private, what they're doing privately in terms of how are they reacting is really more important. Um, and so, as I said earlier, they'll be looking for, are they hunkering down or are they telling people to go attack stuff? So for instance, there's ISIS, there's been a report that ISIS, um, I think this is all open source, right? They're on the one hand telling their people not to travel to Europe because they might get coronavirus and they're in the streets and they're, they're you know, basically instituting martial law in places where they are and they're putting on masks and they're doing all that stuff but they are also telling people to take this as an opportunity to attack targets in Syria so both can be true at the same time <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. there's nothing simple about it unfortunately and that's why people they pay you the big bucks to figure out what's going on <laughs> so let me let me shift to to looking toward the future a little bit because we're we're very good at kind of closing the barn door. We're very good at reacting. We're very good at kind of doing a lot of after action reports and not so good at doing the other thing. People are already talking about a 9-11 style commission report for our response to this pandemic. Let's let the politicians deal with that. Let's look more specifically about how this might change the way intelligence is done in the future. We've already talked about how human is gonna have to change a little bit. Obviously people aren't gonna flood back to big mass groupings for any time soon. Can we see technological innovation that possibly may come out of this or in any new ways of doing intelligence? I mean, agencies are always looking for turning kind of tragedy and opportunities. You know, that's kind of the idea of innovation in the first place. Where do you see, Cindy, the IC moving forward based on what we've done in the last couple months and what we're gonna do for the next couple months? 
Um, just a couple, I haven't really thought about this since. Good question. Um, just a couple things spring to mind and then I'm gonna transfer over to Mark and see if he's got some ideas. Um, one is that I think we're already seeing um, both providers of technology and people who use it um, moving to secure their stuff. So, sorry, that's cyber term, right? Secure your stuff. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I think that it's possible if people are really starting to focus more on security and working online, especially if people don't want to go back to work. Um, they want to go back to work, but they don't want to go back into the office. That's what I meant, right? Um, then it actually might make open source collection more difficult at some point, unless governments take advantage of the security changes that are happening. So there's going to be this, this kind of race going on. Right. Can I, you know, you guys are putting in security for X, Y, and Z. Can I get into that and take advantage of that? And that reminds me of that more recent reporting of the CIA having uh, used a company in Switzerland as a front. Switzerland or Sweden? Uh, Switzerland with the, with the, the, the messing with the, front the encryption systems. company, yeah. right? Yeah. With, so with the BND. Agencies wanting to take advantage of that again now as more and more people are encrypting their stuff and using new technologies. But also it could it could make it different. It could make it more difficult too. And the other thing I'm thinking about is all those poor intelligence workers who still have to go into the office, even though we have a pandemic, um, because they're dealing with classified information. And the community has been talking for a long time about how to, how to do work securely from a distance. And if that hasn't already happened, I would expect that to be accelerating. When a big a big kind of bonus of the job is you literally can't take your work home. You right. can mentally, you can worry about stuff from your house, but <laughs> you can't bring it, you can't, no one's saying I need you to work on that product tonight at your house because you right. can't bring the classified information. That's one of the perks of having a classified job, but that can't continue, especially if we're in a situation like this, there's nothing would ever get done. And you can't force everyone to go to Langley or to go to Fort Meade because this is asking for it. These are self-contained environments on purpose, right? These are these are essentially little teeny bubbles where a disease like this could just fly all over the place. Um, and so, I, yeah, I agree with you that there's going to have to be some kind of an understanding about what do we do if one of these happens on purpose, which certainly is something people need to be thinking about. How do we continue to do intelligence collection analysis when we can't actually go into the office? Um, and what if it just bigger than that. You know, this is the coronavirus is particularly nasty, but it's still. I mean, I don't want to downplay it, but the 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 rate of contagion is not that high. It's not anthrax. The rate of death is very low. This is not the kind of the Ebola scare where you know every other person is dead, right? Right. What if we get hit with one of those? How do we react to that? These have to. There has to be a lot of very serious conversations taking place at the Pentagon and in Fort Meade at Langley right now. Um, so a couple thoughts that I've got on your question, Vince. Um, so first off, I can readily imagine, I think I'm partially echoing Cindy here, I can readily imagine, I would like to hope um, that this may lead analysts themselves to um, make better use of open source information, not just, you know, quote unquote, intelligence per se, um, but but a lot of people, and I'm among them, have been concerned for a long time that there's been too much of a disconnect between the community of intelligence analysts on the one hand and the community of, of, of academic and, and also, you know, private uh, and nonprofit sector uh, experts on the other hand. Um, and um, so, you know, if, if, if this creates more time for analysts to, you know, uh, read journal articles or read books or or forces them to do more, you know, quote unquote, academic outreach through lack of anything, uh, you know, classified to do with their time. Um, I think that's all to the good and hopefully would sort of, um, you know, maybe create some enduring habits. So that's number one. Number two, and I'd be, I'd be interested in Cindy's thought on this, but um, it has long been the case that, you know, transnational issues, global issues, if you will, have always been among um, the, I don't know, sort of, least sexy, least respected, Step least children. career. I'm sorry, say again? The stepchildren. Stepchildren, <laughs> yes, of in the analytic community. Um, and you know, and before 9-11, and Cindy Cindy lived this, right? I mean, terrorism, frankly, fell into that into that bucket as well. It was not considered a career enhancing thing to be a terrorism analyst until 
terrorism analysts became the center of everything, right? <laughs> um, and, and I suspect we may see a similar, not nearly as dramatic, but I suspect we may see a similar reorientation after this where suddenly transnational issues or global issues, whatever you want to call them, become, you know, um, a little less disrespected, right? Um, uh, not, not fully respected, but a little less disrespected. That's... Well, I'm, I'm trying to be realistic here. Right. Um, I mean, they're, they're not going to throw out the, the China hands or the terrorism hands or the Russia hands uh, who tend to tend to be top dogs, but they might get sort of closer uh, in sort of the, the overall sort of respect ranking, uh, for lack of a better yeah. term. You know, Mark, that's a really good point. And, and one thing that you do when you lesser desirable, like lesser attention kind of areas is if you're smart, is you prepare for the day when someone's gonna care and you have a window of opportunity and then you drive a truck through it. So, and then you make a lot of progress until people get bored with that again, right? But at least you make a big leap forward that you, you don't lose all of your momentum. Like, there's some you make it sound like like a political insurgency or a social movement or something like that. Yeah, us analysts never become what we were. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you, you say you. I mean, you're you're not saying this kind of metaphorically or hypothetically, no. Cindy. That was something that you you saw, where you know you guys working within you know the Bin Laden group and working within terrorism in the 1990s had a little bit of attention brought to you in 98 with uh, embassy bombings, a little more in 2000 with the coal, but you, you were pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. People weren't tending to be listening. You know, Kofor Black always talking about slamming his hand out of the White House. 9-11, of course, was the door getting kicked down in a very horrible way. The hope, of course, in the future is that we're not dealing with a global pandemic before we start talking about global pandemics. We're not dealing with, we're not the first time talking about Osama bin Laden in a broader sense after he knocks down two buildings and then, you know, four airplanes. That's where maybe things like this, uh, I don't want to call them black swans, because they're not. They're the people who are they're seeing not. this stuff coming from a mile away. Oh, right? yeah. These are not random acts that no one can see coming. But the things that are less likely, perhaps, or less sexy, you know, we've been looking for the last 80 years about a Russian nuclear attack. You know, we're paying attention to a Chinese attack on Taiwan and the South China Sea. There are people at CIA talking about different things. And maybe someone will stop and listen to them a little bit more than they would not blow them off immediately when there's a guy two or three years ago talking about a pandemic or talking about something like that. Just as the same way in 97 and 96, you guys were saying, hey, there's this group Al-Qaeda with this tall got Saudi who no one's ever heard of that we should need to start paying attention to you know you, you'd hope that these are the kind of things that will open some eyes to that I mean basically are we hoping are we thinking that there are people within the intelligence community okay, right. analysts who are going to be taken more seriously right. when they bring up the non-traditional threats right. coming from the outside or are we now going back to ground zero and, and so this is the problem this is something that nobody has ever solved even in corporate America Right. Sometimes people are incentivized to come up with the crazy things and then they do cool stuff like Google and Apple, but then eventually they normalize and they get back to being like IBM did at one point where they almost went out of business because they weren't innovating anymore. This is a constant human problem. Um, but I do think the intelligence community has to be more deliberate about setting up structures and incentives because otherwise we'll be right back where we were. We always are. Yeah, Mark, it reminds me of the, the movie Canadian Bacon, if you've ever seen that. The, Michael, Sadly, Moore's, no. Michael Moore's only uh, non-documentary where uh, there, there's, the, he, the president has bad ratings, so he picks a fight with Canada. And there was a poor oh. schmuck at the, in the basement of the CIA who was on the Canada desk. And it was this, his one moment of glory. His moment has arrived, the, yeah. Bring the war plan for Canada. And, I mean, that's an extreme case, obviously. But are we in a position, hopefully now, where there, there may be people willing to listen more than there were before to not, not the extremes of Canada, but looking at non-traditional threats more than we have before. The no, extremes of Canada is a phrase you don't hear much, but um, no, really yes, I would, I, would, I, would, I would like to think that that is the case. I would like to think that that is the case. Um, and actually, I think, I, I think it will be. Perhaps not as much as we would want, but I think it will be. But I think the other I thing we have something looming over our shoulder here. You know, is trying to get us here. Yes. Is all the press yeah, right. I think is going to help because unlike 9-11, where everybody jumped to the intelligence community failure and they believed it, 
our press is much more skeptical. There's much more information coming out about who said what when. That doesn't mean that there was a failure per se of any, like it's too early for all of that. But um, I appreciate the skepticism. And so that people are asking those questions and the fact that they're asking them in the open source world gives me some hope that we'll be able to continue this. Great. Well, we have some, yeah, we have some great questions. Some of them you've covered in your conversation, but Cindy, you definitely resonated with a student who wants to know how worried she should be about her college classes um, being conducted over Zoom and going by way of China. And we've all probably been on family calls on Zoom and work calls. So reassure us or scare us. Okay, so first of all, the Chinese already have all your stuff, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but in terms of, so all you have to do is you have to password protect Zoom meetings. So, you know, if your instructors aren't passwording, password protecting your, you know, all they have to do is have everybody sign in with a password, and as long as you do that, you'll find Great. As far as I know right now. <laughs> Uh, somebody else wanted to know how much you think the White House is using open source to figure out what is really going on. Um, yeah, so I, 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 it's not something I know a lot about, um, but but I would say that I know that in the White House Situation Room, um, where um, many of the staffers come from, the intelligence agencies, um, but in the White House Situation Room, they pay very close attention to uh, open source uh, reporting. Um, and it's, you know, unsurprisingly, frequently the first time, first way rather that they hear about all sorts of things. Um, and this is a, this is a, this, this particular issue that we've been talking about today is one in which um, I would imagine, though I don't know, I'd be interested in Cindy's thoughts on this, but I would imagine that open source is actually bringing proportionally more to the table than it does on many, if not most issues. So I would, I, I, I would, suspect that that um that it's probably really really central to what they do both directly and then obviously also you know the stuff that they're getting from cdc and from the intelligence community and whatnot also integrates open source into the either just sort of scientific or the classified uh, you know um, overall stream that's interesting that also makes me think of something that we didn't talk about which is the competing voices um mm. so policymakers have various intelligence agencies and cabinet parts of the cabinet, parts of the government, but they also have their friends and their contacts in foreign governments yeah. and their political advisors and somebody on a news network who thinks that something is a cure and, you know, all that stuff. So um, that's also a challenge for intelligence sometimes. Sometimes your job, part of your job as an intelligence analyst is to know your customer and what other voices they're hearing from so that you can sort of speak to what they know and think. And let me jump in here because this is a little bit of a scientific intelligence question. When you're looking at science, which is really what this is, right? We're talking about medicine and about science, the vaccines and about diseases. The internationalization of science comes into play here, where mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, the information is coming in from other countries, not because of the CIA, not because of the government, but because scientists are talking to each other, because doctors are talking to each other, because, you know, these innovations and a lot of these scientific discoveries are happening jointly in many cases between doctors of different countries. And normally things about biology, things about diseases don't tend to be considered highly classified. I know we're kind of starting to think about that as more of a national security threat, but I imagine there are members of the CDC working with Chinese, you know, epidemiologists. Absolutely. And so there's a direct line of communication, assuming the governments allow it now, that is open between the actual scientists of these countries that might be bringing in more information than any intelligence agency might be. And these are these are going directly to the policymakers. There's a reason that you see right. in every single one of the press conferences, these doctors, whether it's Fauci or if it's Bricks sitting there, um, they are the ones who are in touch with their, their contemporaries overseas. And that's where a lot of this key information is coming from. That's right. I was going to say on counterterrorism, that's one of the things we did before 9-11 was, you know, we and the FBI and others build this international coalition, if you will, of, of governments who cared about the issue and were willing to talk to each other about that one thing, right? 
and and then you get that information sharing going. It's so important. Do, do what you said about that one thing, <laughs> you need to apply there that maybe that might be the only thing they're willing to share on. It might be the only thing they're willing to talk about, right? Yeah. Um, but you have to be willing to when it's an international or global problem, right? We've got it. We've got other great questions, and I, whoop, we will run over slightly. I'm going to ask this quickly, Mark. And yes. mute, my, uh, mute my phone. Um, how can you be so sure that this was not um, that this was not um, an epidemic did not begin in the lab in China? Yeah. Um, well, the short answer is that there's no evidence for it. Um, and Occam's razor suggests you go with the simplest explanation. You don't sort of multiply causes uh, needlessly. Uh, I'm not saying that it would be literally impossible that that had happened. As I, you know, indicated, something analogous did happen in uh, in Sverdlovsk in the late 1970s. Um, but when there's no evidence for it, and pandemics happen all the time from perfectly normal natural causes, um, uh, it's there's not only no need, but it's actually um, um, dysfunctional, for lack of a better word, to assume the longer answer. The longer answer is that it, you almost hope. So, because it would show that the Chinese bioweapons people are horrendous. This is a horrible, a horrible disease to use as a bioweapon. It is a weak, weak virus. It can be killed very easily. Um, soap and kills water primarily, right? Right. kills disproportionately old people as opposed to, you know, like military age males, for instance. Right, and, and, um, it's, and it's, it's, its death rate is 1% or lower. Um, you can very easily keep it from spreading. It's not something like, again, like an anthrax, like the, the, the weapons grade anthrax the Soviets created and the other that was, diseases that were even worse than the anthrax the Soviets created. That was, that's the end of civilization level kind of bioweapon stuff. And most of these are genetically engineered. Again, like Mark mentioned, military age men or genetically engineering bioweapons to attack Asians, for example, or Arabs, right? These are the, this is the level of bioweapons that we're talking about today. So something can that you I, can beat can with so- could I say something there, Vince? You know, I am so sad to see something that I expected to happen, happen, which is so many communities of color are suffering so many losses disproportionate um, to their profile, you know, in areas all over the United States. And I've been I've been thinking, you know, how ripe is this for disinformation for oh, yeah. people to right. believe it's yeah. been created? You're saying it wasn't created to target people, but I believe there's some communities that are going to feel like, no, it, it was created to target them. Well, what's so worse? Sorry. No, I'm sorry. What's <laughs> worse, right? The, the argument that this was created by the Chinese to kill black Americans or that the systemic racism in the United States and the fact that black Americans tend to be much poorer and they can't have access to good health care is what's actually killing a disproportionate amount right. of black. So you're damned if you do, if you're damned if you don't, right? I mean, it's the idea of how do you twist this if you're the Americans? There's no good answer to this. It's a really terrible situation that something like 73% of deaths in Milwaukee, which is a city that only has like 20% African-Americans or, or African-Americans, right? Or Chicago, other places. The, and I and almost I, want it to be a disease that disproportionately affects African-Americans. If you are on one end of the spectrum saying, uh, the other example is that we're really bad at this at a society. Yeah. And yeah, we have an underclass that's just being disproportionately affected by this. Sorry. Sam. Yeah, and I, I suspect this is likely to be a theme Thanks, that will sorry. be picked up in, <laughs> it picked up in, uh, picked up in, um, um, uh, you know, uh, Russian social media, uh, you know, campaigns and that sort of thing. And we saw analogous things. We saw analogous things um, uh, with uh, the Soviet uh, intelligence services targeting African Americans, uh, particularly in the you know 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, not because of disease issues, but because of you know Jim Crow basically, and gave them a fertile opportunity here um, for attempting um, to to appeal to African Americans. So if I was if I was Russia, I'd be pretty psyched about the fact yeah. that people of color are disproportionately dying in the United States. Now, that gives me something to work with. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say something about conspiracy theories in general. Like we can inoculate ourselves to this, but people don't because they want to believe crazy. They want to believe these things, right? Um, the only thing you have to have for conspiracy theory is, is you know, the knowledge that you can't prove a negative. I can't <laughs> prove that it didn't come out of a Chinese lab, but I can demonstrate through the positive evidence that another scenario is extremely likely, right? 
And so that's that's what I want people to remember when they're looking at any of these conspiratorial things. Go for the positive evidence. Is that convincing? All right. Well, um, we have other questions we didn't get to. We may try to answer those via email. Later on, I'll share those questions with our panelists today. I can't thank you enough for this really engaging and deep and spirited conversation. It's it's clear everybody here is friends. And um, thanks for texting me, Vince, and telling me to get on. I was like, you're supposed to ask me. Oh, sorry. I thought texting would be smoother. It'd be smoother if you just kind of appeared. And I'm like, oh, oh, hi, hi, I'm back. Well, you I imagine how our in-person conversations are. We're only barely talking over each other right now. And I'm so glad that Elwood was able to join us with some really great cameos. Um, we will be back next Thursday at this time at noon with our director, Chris Costa, and um, his spy chat. He'll have one of our board members, Steve Case, or Steve Cash speaking, who's actually uh, worked on, uh, you know, intelligence committee of having scientists able to speak to the intelligence community about scientific issues and pandemics. So that's going to be really fascinating. If you need something not about the pandemic, I will be back and talking this evening at 5.30 in a happy hour about Mata Hari, the World War I spy. We have tons of other programs. We have stuff for adults. We have stuff for parents who are now homeschooling. Oh my God, it's just a nightmare. Um, we're here to help you. Check out our website. And um, this program, like lots of our live programs and other online programs, will end up on our YouTube channel. And listen to Vince's podcast. Well, we had one thing, Amanda, at the end. Like, we're, we're now just starting to gear up. So if you check the website and you saw a couple things like a week and a half ago, go back. Because every day, Amanda, who is the director of, of adult programming, is putting more and more stuff on there. So we're trying to entertain and educate and whatever we can do while we're in our living rooms. But every day, we're finding more and innovative ways to do programming like this. And that's what Amanda has been doing. Uh, and, and so don't just check the website today and not look at it again for the rest of the summer, because there's always new stuff popping up. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, really. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. It was so much fun. Thank you. Be well. <laughs> Bye.